Hey, everyone. Welcome to Conversations with Curtis. My name is Paul Morgan Stetler, and I am the host of this channel. And today I am very excited to bring to you a conversation with Aaron Giles. Aaron is a Seattle-based programmer responsible for a lot of very interesting ports and emulations. And because I have no idea what a port or an emulation is, it just made sense to have my partner, Daniel Albu, conduct this interview. Since Daniel is a programmer and game developer himself, we thought it might be interesting for you to see some more technical interviews that he conducts with other programmers like him, uh, where they can geek out and talk shop and say all kinds of big words that I don't understand. So today, Daniel will be talking with Aaron about everything from his early days at LucasArts to his newest emulation project called Dream. So please enjoy this conversation without Curtis as Daniel Albu interviews Aaron Giles. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Conversations with Curtis. My name is Daniel Albu, and today I am joined by Aaron Giles. According to his official website, Aaron is a freelance Seattle area programmer, musician, web developer, and graphic designer. In addition to that, I would like to add that he's also a LucasArts alumni and in my opinion, an emulation whiz. Aaron Giles, welcome to Conversations with Curtis. Thanks for having me on. How are you? Oh, that's good. It's about noontime in Seattle. The kid's off at school, so it's a nice, quiet environment to, to talk. Yeah, it's a great time for a conversation. <laughs> it's 10 p.m. over here. <laughs> it's so amazing that we can have conversations across the world. Yeah. It's a pleasure to meet you. I've been planning to interview you for quite some time, and I'm glad that it finally worked out. Now, as I've stated, you labor yourself a programmer, a musician, a web developer, and a graphic designer. Which of these titles do you think <laughs> describes you best at the moment? Oh, for sure, programmer, I would say. I, I've, uh, you know, I spent most of my career from my from as a kid to a program as a programmer and uh, working on 8-bit computers and assembly language and trying to write video games. And then um, through most of my career, I, I dabbled in physics in college because I thought that I knew computers pretty well, but I should learn something new and maybe that would be my career path. Uh, but then I ended up just doing computers and physics and decided that I'd rather just do computers full time. Uh, so I went back to computers full time and then uh, Right up until, uh, you know, I've been working at uh, Microsoft and various other companies uh, throughout my career uh, as a as a programmer uh, up until last year, about a, well, just about a year ago, when I finally left my corporate job and decided to uh, freelance at this point. Uh, and that's sort of been my long term goal. So I'm kind of glad I got to a point where I could feel comfortable doing that. Well, we'll get to that. I personally knew you by different titles altogether. The first time I, I heard your name, or should I say saw your name, was in the summer 96 issue of The Adventurer. <laughs> now, to those who don't know, The Adventurer was a LucasArts magazine that was distributed inside the big boxes of LucasArts titles. I presume that you have... I actually just saw a copy of it as I was straightening out the office before I came here, and there was a copy of The Adventurer in there. So we have a visual aid of The Adventurer. Mm. I don't think this is the, the the issue you're talking about. But... <laughs> and um, in that specific issue, they interviewed you in the Lucas Who section, which was dedicated to interviewing LucasArts employees. Mm -hmm. Every every issue had those. And you're in that um, issue. Do you remember the title that they gave you in that piece? No. <laughs> no, I fear well... it. <laughs> Well, your title was Senior Programmer and Mac Magician. <laughs> and do you remember that interview? Uh, I remember doing an interview for them. I mean, the uh, when I joined LucasArts, it was an interesting time because the Mac had just transitioned to the PowerPC processor uh and apple was making a renewed effort to make games a big thing uh and so they started contacting the various companies saying hey can you make your games work on the mac and um you know there were of course mac games but getting the the the, the bigger companies to agree to port their games to run on the mac was a big thing and so they were trying to get doom they were trying to get other games of the era ported to the mac and uh, lucasarts was one of the companies they approached 
Uh, and for sure, LucasArts was interested in doing the Mac because for their history, all many of their adventure games and past games ran on multiple platforms. So it was sort of in their, in their uh, DNA already to support multiple platforms. And uh, in fact, they had released Mac versions of some of their earlier adventure games like Loom and Secret of Monkey Island. And um, those were all done by a contractor. So the contractor's name was Eric Johnston, um, who later went on to work on Nintendo 64 titles like Shadows of the Empire and stuff like that. And uh, was a long time LucasArts guy. Um, but at the time when I joined, Eric was sort of wanting to get out of doing the Mac stuff and was interested in starting to work on the new Nintendo 64 work. And so they were looking for somebody to bring in house full time to work on the Mac ports of the games. Uh, and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. How did you get into programming to begin with? <laughs> so that was, I mean, video games was always my, my driving force. So when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in the arcade era uh, in the Atari 2600 era. That was, you know, where I discovered video games and I knew that right then that video games were something that was really cool and I wanted to be able to uh, participate in, in creating them almost right away. Like playing them was pretty interesting and I enjoyed going to the arcades and playing them, but I was really curious how they worked and what was involved in making them. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then um, what happened was, uh, so I was begging my dad for a computer and my best friend, we were... I had another friend who was super into programming, very similar mindset to me, and his dad had an Apple II, and they were making. He and his dad actually, in his spare time, was making games. And to me, that that blew my mind. I was like, "Oh my god, I totally want to be that guy." I wish I was so jealous of him. And I begged my dad. I said, "Dad, we got to get a computer. We got to get a computer." And he worked in IT. He was actually an early. He worked. Uh, he was a um, mainframe IBM mainframe uh, system specialist, and uh, he worked in hospitals. So you know, not a very sexy job, but a very necessary job. And it involved computers, which is great. And so he said, well, we can get a computer, but it has to be useful for me for work. Because if I need, it would save me if I could dial in at night, if an important call came in and I could dial in, they actually had dial in capabilities at the hospitals. And this is, you know, probably 19. Which year was that? 1980. So these were like direct dials into the terminals, you know, and I don't even know that they had uh, anything very fancy there, but it was something that he could do in the event of that sort of thing. So he said, we can get a computer, but it has to be suitable for my work. And that immediately ruled out pretty much all the fun computers because you know, any, any a 40 column computer on a, on a TV was not gonna cut it for what he wanted. And it had to have 80 columns, had to have a good terminal program that he could use uh, to dial in. And uh, so we eventually, for Christmas one year, he surprised me and got the computer and it was a Heathkit H89, which was a Z80 based CPM machine that was in a thousand parts that you had to assemble together in your basement. And my dad's not an electrical engineer by any stretch of the imagination, but he persevered. He knew how much I wanted a computer. And for three months, I think it was took us about three months to build, the computer. To build the computer. And you know, he soldered, he did all the soldering because I was too young at that time to be doing the soldering. We put it together, turned it on, and it worked the first time. And we couldn't believe it. I, I think he was as shocked as anybody. And so I was excited it was a computer, but it was definitely not the computer I wanted. Um, but I made do. So I said, well, I'm going to figure out how to write games on this. And it had text mode with some graphics characters. There was no graphics mode that you could access. Um, but it had basic, so I learned some basic. Um, but pretty quickly, I realized I was too slow. So I was like, well, now I have to learn assembly language because all real games are written in assembly language. And certainly in the arcades, they were. And so um, I learned 8080 assembly language uh, in order to write games. And I wrote some games involving text characters moving around the screen. Um, and that was sort of the, the birth of my, my, my computing uh, history. And eventually, uh, a few years later, since he was an IBM guy, we got a PC Junior. Um, which a lot of people maligned the PC Junior, but you know that was my machine. I, I that was my my machine during my teenage years, my formative years as a programmer, and I worked the heck out of that machine, and uh, <clears throat> learned all its quirks, learned how to hack games that were written for the IBM PC that had incompatibilities with the PC Junior. I figured out how to load them up in the debugger, figure out how to what they were doing, and figured out how to hack around them. I figured out how to hack copy protection and all the other good stuff that- At what age did all of this happen? 
this was basically my teenage years, so like 13 to 16 years old in, my, in the basement of my parents' house. And I used that PC Junior up until I went to college at 18. So it was basically those five years. I learned 8086 assembly language, obviously, for that, and learned Pascal, Turbo Pascal had just come out. So that was an exciting new development. That was my first high level language that compiled. So that was pretty exciting. Um, no, lots of great stories from there. Sadly, all my source code was lost um, from uh, during a move after I went to college. So I, I had five and a quarter inch floppies, and they didn't make some transition. And so I really wish I had the source code. I connected to BBSs. I was online, you know, early in the time. So a lot of my programs, I, I made a few games. I uploaded them to BBSs. And I, every time there's a, a dump of a BBS, you know, ephemera online, I go pour, pouring through it to see, oh, do they have, you know, rescue.com or risque.com, these programs that I wrote back in the day, these little games that I uploaded. Because I, I don't know if they ever went anywhere, but my hope was that, you know, they were shareware and they'd go out somewhere, but nobody ever sent me any money for them. So. <laughs> and which which was the first application that you actually developed and released? Do you, do you count games as applications? I, I count <laughs> applications as applications because you said that you already... <laughs> You so, said that you already released games into BBSs, but I'm talking something yeah. a, bit, a bit more. Um... So yeah, something a little more broad. I did go beyond games. Um, you know, I was into Dungeons and Dragons. I wrote a bunch of you know everybody writes their Dungeons and Dragons character building tools and sheets and stuff. One of the things uh, back in the day, they had uh, one of my favorite magazines was Compute. They had Compute PC and PC Junior, a specific one for the PC. Where they always had these programs that you'd have to type in. And, uh, yeah, you'd have the code written in the in the magazine itself, and you'd have to. It's not even copy paste. You'd actually have to type in and yes, debug yes. it yourself. Hopefully, you copied yep. it correctly. Yep, and uh, I I dutifully typed in many programs from those things because I was fascinated to find out how things worked. So that was that was a great learning experience for me. But uh, one of the things that uh, I quickly proved frustrated about is that you made errors, as you mentioned, as you typed them in. You're it's manual typing, so. Um, uh, a lot of the other platforms like the Apple II and the Commodore 64, they provided programs that you could also type in, but once you type them in and save them, they would patch the basic interpreter to um, every time you typed a line, it would print a checksum on the front of the line. Mm -hmm. And you can compare the checksum to what was printed in the magazine to know whether you typed that line correctly. Well, that's yeah. just cheating. It was totally cheating, but it was, it was, it's, it's a huge time saver. Uh, but they never made that patch for the PC. Uh, I actually did make a patch for the PC that actually computed the checksums and tried to send it into them, but they did not accept it for whatever reason. And I thought that was a pretty brilliant hack that I figured out how to hack the basic interpreter. Yeah, it's more fun to to uh, count parentheses to see where the bug actually is. Or <laughs> Let me call in. It's usually that you finger fumbled, you know, an eight to a seven, and somehow that was really important, and you didn't know that it was a a problem. So that was a terrible way to to uh to write code but I, it was instructional for me and, and that was maybe a terrible way to, to write code but it's a great way to learn programming in general yeah so that and you know those classic uh, basic computer game books uh, the yeah i guess i'll have them over on my bookshelf the uh yellow and red uh books that were all in generic basic and you could type those in as well and i typed in a bunch of those and learned out how, to, how games worked and some of the game logic there so and but, uh, and how did you get from that to Mac programming? Okay, so um, yeah, so I was a PC junior guy all the way through college, up until college. And when I left for college, I knew a few things. I knew that I was super into computers. I knew quite a bit about computers, that I probably shouldn't just study computers because that was like taking, taking the easy route to me. And that sounds silly when I say it like that, but I just mean like, I felt like, I could just coast my way through college on computers pretty easily, but like if I majored in something else, then that would be a way of broadening my horizons, which I felt intellectually was a good thing to do. I was going to a liberal arts college and I figured it was uh, good to broaden my horizons. So uh, I left for college. I didn't have a computer. I had a word processor. So a dedicated Smith Corona word processor I had a little daisy wheel uh, Type, it was basically a daisy wheel typewriter with a tiny little computer and a three-line LCD display. And I would edit my papers on those. And little tiny, these little tiny floppy disks, they were smaller than three and a half inch, or like two and a half inch floppy disks. Um, you could save, you know, 10 papers on them or whatever and do that. And uh, so I went to college with that and wrote my first few papers there. But then 
the college was very Mac centric when I went to the University of Chicago. Um, they had Mac labs set up and this was right at the time that the first color Macs were showing up. So it was, you know, a lot of kids in the dorm had um, Mac, uh, Mac SEs, the black and white ones. That was the most common thing. Uh, but there was a girl down the hall, just two doors down from me, who had a, a Mac 2CX, which was eight megs of RAM and a portrait display. Like her father went all out and got like everything fancy for her. And that was probably, I think I saw the bill for it at one point. It was like an $8,000 system at the time. And she got sent off to that. And so um, I, of course, thought that that was pretty cool. You know, I visited the labs, used, played on their computers. They had like the color Shanghai game, the, the Mahjong uh, games, which I didn't care about that so much, but it was just so pretty to look at. You know, 256 colors, 640, 480 graphics, you know, compared to what was on the PC at the time, all the games were, you know, 320 by 200. And, and had a lot of colors, but yeah, yeah low, low, low resolution VGA. Mm -hmm. So not, uh, not particularly impressive. So the Macs definitely like looked way more impressive, but then of course they had nice word processors and laser writer, later laser writer printers were available. The first laser writers were there and or even the image writers, uh, the dot matrix versions that you could print from the Mac, those were pretty sweet. And so I started doing my papers on those. Um, and it turns out that the girl down the hall who had the Mac 2CX was was uh, pretty interested. We were pretty interested in each other. And uh, so I got to hang out in her room a lot and play on her computer uh, a lot. And so that's kind of where I learned to use the Mac, but I didn't really program the Mac um, for the first couple of years I was in college. I pretty much stayed away from programming entirely for the first couple of years in college, focused on studies, learning physics, doing other things um but then uh my my girlfriend was a french literature major uh she went to study in paris for a year uh junior year and she's like well what am i gonna do with my computer and i'm like i'll take it <laughs> you can put that that lovely uh 2cx with the portrait display in my in my uh, dorm room and i'll happily take care of it for you and make sure it's here when you get back and so uh that's when i i didn't have the distraction of uh, a girlfriend and i didn't have uh and I had a nice computer in my dorm room that I didn't have to go to a lab to, to use. And so that's when I started learning programming. And right around that time, Apple released QuickTime, the first first version of QuickTime, which you know was pretty impressive at the time, even the little postage stamp, you know, videos that you could get out of them. But uh, but the cool thing was that it also encompassed other things like image compression and stuff like that. So they had a uh, a uh, program, they had a in QuickTime you could basically load a, an image blob like a JPEG file and throw it at QuickTime and it would decode it into a bitmap for you so you didn't have to know how to decode a JPEG file. Uh, and that was pretty cool. And so I wrote sample programs to do that because, you know, the web, the World Wide Web, we just got access to that. Um, Which year you know, was that? This was, well, I was doing my programming in 91, 92, but our, our dorm was online through the local talk network in 89, 90. So like, we were, we were pretty early on in the internet. We all had yeah. email addresses assigned to us when we moved in, but probably only 10% of the students actually knew what the email address was and how to access it. Um, you kind of had to be a little more of a command line guru in those early days or have a uh, the right Mac programs to uh, to access it. So anyway, at the time, um, you know, NCSA Mosaic was the web browser of the, of the time. And so uh, it, the early web browsers didn't have the ability to show images in line at all. Um, if you had an image, you had to click on it and it would load an external program, which would load the image for you. And so uh, since QuickTime had this ability to display a JPEG image, all I had to do is write the glue to be like, I'm a program that can load a JPEG image and show it up on the screen. And then I said, NCSM is a mosaic. I'm your helper program for JPEGs. And I could use my program to display the JPEG images. And I used that, I refined that, and that became a sort of a right place at the right time uh, piece of freeware that kind of was on the early Mac. Uh, early uh, Macs became sort of the default image viewer for NCSA Mosaic and various other programs because I was free, so I was cheap and uh, pretty pretty decent viewer. Now, now classic retro gamers probably know the term shareware because you said freeware, but yeah. for those who don't, a shareware game was basically what you'd call nowadays a demo version or a trial version or free to play. Meaning that you'd only have access to a small part of the game or the application. Mm -hmm. And in order to get the full thing, you'd have to send a check by mail. Right. Now, apparently, there is also such a thing as postcardware, which, according to Wikipedia, you were the first to use the concept. Yeah, I don't know if Wikipedia is right on that. I have, I, I'm not entirely sure I came up with that idea, but... 
that um, I don't know anybody else to point them to. So I'll, I'll take the credit until the real Thank inventor you. comes up. But, uh, but yeah, I, um, I, I did, I thought free was great, but it'd be kind of cool to know that people are using my, my software. Um, and so I said, well, if you, um, if you like my program, send me a postcard and here's my address. And, uh, over the course of about 10 years, I received over 6,000 postcards um, in the mail. I have a, a giant stack of bins with all the postcards in them. And um, one of the first things I did actually when I uh, left my my day job is I went on a project to scan all 6,000 of those postcards in for for uh, to catalog them because I've always been kind of curious what to do with them. And I thought, well, okay. 6,000. Yes. You want a feed scanner for something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask if you did it manually, one by one. <laughs> had that much free time. I did them 10 by 10. <laughs> Stacks of 10. And, and what did you do with all the postcards afterwards, after you scanned them? They're still in bins. I, I, haven't, I haven't recycled them or anything like that. I think I'll probably hang on to them forever. <laughs> okay. Now, a lot of um, the viewers of our channel um, love adventure games we're focusing mainly on the adventure games so you worked at one of the greatest adventure game companies out there which was LucasArts uh, when did you start working at LucasArts and how did that come about so um, I started in January 95 and it came about because as I mentioned before they were their their Mac contractor was looking to join the company full-time and work on Nintendo 64 stuff and so they wanted somebody new to come on and work on um work on uh, the Mac ports. And um, right before then, his last, the last port that the previous guy did was a uh, port of Rebel Assault, um, which had just come out and was a super impressive demo. Everybody was excited about it because when you look at the game now, it's kind of not that great of a game, but at the time it was a full motion cinematic, full screen video and you're act interactively flying your ships. And so that was, that was pretty sweet. And they made a Mac version of it. And as I mentioned before, the, um, Apple had just introduced the PowerPC Max. And like they do today when they introduce a new computer architecture, um, they had an emulator to run the old software on the new architecture. So to run old Motorola 68000 based software on the PowerPC Max that were all ran through an emulator. And it was pretty seamless. Uh, they did a, a pretty good job of it, but um, it was just performance wise, it wasn't quite up to snuff. And so what would happen with Rebel Assault, which was not written for the PowerPC at all, is only written for the classic Motorola chips, um, was it would mostly run pretty okay, but it would hiccup uh, as you're playing. It was not the smooth experience you thought. And of course, a PowerPC was the top of the line uh, Mac at the time. And so you, you bought the top of the line Mac, but it's not running your older software as well as, you know, a decent, you know, 68040 based machine or, or, you know, like a six, you know, six four what is the 840AB, uh, high-end quadras and stuff they had at the time. So um, I had been studying, I'd been very fascinated by the transition to PowerPC. I had been studying how the interaction between the, the emulated code worked and the, the native code worked. And I understood that there was ways that you could patch into uh, the old emulated code. You could patch native routines to do certain things. And I said, well, if I can figure out where the program is spending all its time, I could hack the the binary that they shipped for the executable that they shipped for the 68040 and hack in some native PowerPC code in some key spots, and then it would run smoothly on my computer, and that would be great. And I did that, and uh, it turned out to be quite easy because there was a couple of very obvious spots uh, to improve. And I thought, well, um, this is pretty cool. Why don't I share this with people? And so I created a little patch utility and I released it for the Mac. Uh, and so you could download it on the internet and it was basically download this utility, run it against your Rebel Assault, it'll patch your executable and you'd have fast native performance uh, on your on your on on the game that you bought. Um, and uh, apparently LucasArts caught wind of that. Uh, they had an internal debate about what to do, whether they were going to sue me uh, to make me take it down or whether they were going to um, take advantage of the fact that they had a Mac programmer who was obviously enthusiastic about their their stuff and maybe see if I wanted to come join them. And fortunately, it ended up in a job offer and not in a... Uh, in a lawsuit, uh, yeah. Just, 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 <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I took it. I, and, I, you know, obviously, at that time, joining a games company was my, my dream. I mean, so, you know, they didn't have to talk me very hard into uh, into joining them. 
Yeah, in January 95, it was after a lot of their classics were already released. Like the yeah. Identical and Indiana Jones and you came at a great yeah, time. From a, yeah, from an adventure point of view, and of course you can't see the future, so you don't know exactly what's coming up, but from an adventure game point of view, like they had just kind of hit a, a few, you know, home runs uh in a row on, on, on their adventure games and the Star Wars stuff was up and coming and I was a Star Wars fan. Uh, and so it was a pretty exciting time to to join. And, you know, I looked at what was coming up, you know, we were on the cusp of Dark Forces was coming out soon, Full Throttle was coming out, and that game just looked amazing. Um, and so with those on the horizon, I thought, wow, this is going to be a pretty exciting time. So which which was your first project there? Oh, Dark Forces, for sure. So, you know, the Mac at the time kind of suffered in comparison to the PC from a variety of games. And so games that were like first-person shooters, you, you had Marathon. I don't even know if Marathon had been released yet. It was around the time of Marathon, uh, Bungie's game. On the, on the Mac, it was all... Bungie was pretty much it in terms of uh, first-person shooter games. And so uh, Apple was trying to get... They were trying to get Doom. I know they were they got Doom ported as well, uh, but they were really lobbying LucasArts to get Dark Forces ported to the Mac. And at the time, the key was the Mac versions had to show off the Mac a little bit. And so... Um, it was a it was probably the most invasive port I did of any of the games in that um, Dark Forces was written to run in Mode X three twenty by two hundred graphics on VGA and uh, that was not going to cut it on the Mac uh, resolution wise that that kind of sucked Max all had minimum six forty four eighty was pretty much the minimum color resolution um, uh, ignoring the five they did go dabble with 512 by 384 for a little while but 64040 was sort of the minimum resolution and uh the expectation was that we would port dark forces and make it look pretty uh, on the mac uh, and so the goal was we had to make the engine able to run in higher resolutions than it was originally designed for uh and uh and all the user interface art and chrome and around everything kind of had to be upgraded as well uh, so that it didn't look super blocky and chunky so uh, were so, there changes in the artwork as well, yeah. or just yeah, they, you worked with the DOS version as is and you ported it to the Mac? No. So the, at that time, I took the DOS version of the core game engine, and we had to upgrade that to support 640 by 40. And then we they actually did get all the artists to regenerate the art at higher resolutions. And so all the all the uh, like the loading screen and the not 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 the not the animated video. The cutscene video was was kind of as is, but uh, the cutscene video at the time was not full motion video. It was a little more like the X Wing Tie Fighter style of like you know there were elements and they kind of you know animated Sprites the moving front. on top. Yeah, of the yeah, background. yeah, yeah, yeah. They were a little more that style of things, and so you know that wasn't quite as hard, big of a lift to get those things in higher resolution. I can't actually remember whether they did all of that. All those sprites and everything in higher resolution or not. It's been a long time since I've looked at the Mac version of that. Um, but the, the end core engine for sure was in higher resolution, and that definitely pushed the Mac hard. Uh, yeah. And at the time, eight megabytes was sort of your top end machine, which was also the requirement for the DOS side. Uh, but on the Mac, you had the operating system, which was a couple megabytes of space already, and you're doing higher resolution. And we had to make that fit in the same amount of memory as the DOS version had for you know everything when it had. Had that so that was definitely a big challenge to squeeze it all down in there. So how did you double the resolution in half the? <laughs> half well, the, the textures half. weren't any bigger, so that we didn't make the textures higher resolution. So that mm -hmm. took up a lot of the memory when you're running. Um, and then, actually, I think I did. We did experiment with downgrading or compressing some of the textures a little bit in ways that were not like super obvious. And then, a lot of it was just nipping and tucking here, losing a little bit of memory here, maybe, you know, swapping out some things a little more aggressively. Uh, it was sort of an iterative process, uh, but uh, yeah, we did it. It was a, I did it and we, the port only took about six months from the time I arrived to the time it was done. We didn't ship it right away, but it was pretty much done within the first six months. And uh, so, you know, And in you that time you right. worked exclusively on Dark Forces or did you work on yeah, Force Rather that than... and and full well, so there were three things I was sort of working on at the at the same time. One was Dark Forces, and Dark Forces used the iMuse engine um, for its music. Um, and um, the iMuse engine had been previously ported for you know all the adventure games, Monkey but it had not been ported native to the PowerPC. And so I sort of 
started on a new port that was fresh for the PowerPC. Um, and there were two motivations behind that. One was just better performance. We upgraded the sound to output 16-bit sound instead of 8-bit sound. Um, but also, uh, a friend of mine was had been hired to work on the X-Wing and TIE Fighter ports to the Mac, which were also upgraded engines, high-res support. Um, and it used the same iMuse engine. And so even though I had nothing to do officially with the X-Wing and TIE Fighter ports, I did get credit for doing the iMuse uh, for, for those uh for those ports. So I, that was my contribution to that. So I worked on the iMuse engine with the idea that it would support multiple games, the Dark Forces, and I also worked on Full Throttle. And that was a new port of Full Throttle to the Power PC. These were all kind of fresh ports. So I wasn't really able to reuse a lot of what was there before. I kind of took a, a fresh approach because we were going to a new architecture and things were kind of moving in a direction that was more, uh, didn't really lend itself to reusing a lot of what had been done before on the Mac. Now, most of our viewers know the SCUM system on which most of LucasArts adventure games based. Right. Um, did you get to work on SCUM itself or just the port of SCUM to, to Mac? Yeah, a little bit of the SCUM itself. But the, the funny thing is most of my career has been porting or emulating. Uh, those are my two two main areas. And um, a lot of people don't, don't quite get that when you do either of those uh, efforts, it ideally you don't even have to know how anything works underneath you like i don't have i didn't have to know how scum worked in order to port it i just had to know where does it touch video where does it touch audio where does it touch input controls where does it touch the operating system and then all those points points of contact had to be kind of swapped out and substituted with mac mac centric versions of those but all the inner parts if they're written in c and you can just recompile it then in theory, it should just compile. And as long as they're not interacting directly with you know data structures that are supplied by the operating system or anything like that, you can pretty much use them use that code as is. And Scum was actually, because it, Scum in the past had been ported to many different platforms, it had already had all those points of contact abstracted out. So it was already, you know, you already knew you had to write a video.c that had all the video routines in it. And you had to write, you know, and iMuse was the sound engine, so you just had to port iMuse. But like, I didn't have to know how actors worked or how lock boxes worked. Like none of that stuff, you know, I, I know they exist. I, I know there's cool tools out there to explore that stuff. But if you came and asked me, I'd be the wrong person to ask, you know, how does, how is that implemented or how is, how is that done? Because as a port, I just had to make it talk to the Mac operating system and, you know, make the video stuff work. And most of the rest of the stuff was all done by the engine programmers, Eric Wilmender and, and all those guys who worked on it. So under the hood, it was still scum as is. Every time they released a new scum version, you just had to work on porting the scum engine, the scum version as is to for that particular game without yeah. any changes yeah, in there scum? Was, yeah, there was very little. In fact, once I came on, one of my big goals was that every game should be port ready when it's done. You know, when they, like they might be writing for DOS or for Windows as their first version. But like it should be super easy going forward for another port to another operating system to be done. And so a lot of the work I did when I first joined LucasArts was to educate everybody on here are here's where you need to abstract out certain behaviors so that it's easy for somebody like me to come in and make the changes necessary to make it up and running. And so, you know, every game that I worked on was easier and easier and easier, less work for me to do it until by the time we did like Afterlife and uh, Mortimer, uh, those games, I mean, they were pretty much ready out of the box to be ported. And in fact, some of the games that never saw Mac releases were super ready to be ported. We just didn't decide to ship them. So things like Outlaws was, I mean, I had, the Mac version ran. I actually had a, a Mac version of Shadows of the Empire, the Nintendo 64 game running on 3D FX cards uh, and 3D native on the Mac. And that was running pretty well, but we never shipped it because it wasn't, you know, viable for them to go through the testing phase you know honestly a lot of the the the, the cost of a port is uh, the cost of the port became almost negligible from from a development point of view and most of the cost of the port became the testing and compatibility making sure that it ran well uh, and the fine tuning <clears throat> and so that's that's kind of where the cost benefit is they got to look at the sales and say does that if i'm going to spend this much on testers to uh 
to make sure the games run well, that people are going to be happy and that we're not going to have so many product support calls that that also kills the profitability of the game. Does that make financial sense? And they kind of drew the line after things like Afterlife and Mortimer and before things like uh, <clears throat> Outlaws came out and that's sort of where, where they stopped. You mentioned a lot of LucasArts titles. Which of LucasArts titles did you actually get to work on officially and unofficially? Let's say. <laughs> So officially, I came on to do Dark Forces and Full Throttle. Those were the two two big ones. And so when they came out, <clears throat> they tended to come in pairs. So the next pair that came out was um, that was on the docket was The Dig, was another Scum game, and um, Rebel Assault Two. Um, and conveniently, those <clears throat> excuse me, those two were pretty um, connected in that they both use the Insane engine. Insane was the full motion video engine that Vince Lee developed for Rebel Assault. And Full Throttle was the first hybrid game that used Scum as the adventure game engine. And then all the cutscenes were pre-rendered video that was compressed by the Insane engine. And in fact, Full Throttle went a step further and had the road rash sequences where you're fighting and it was actually interactive, kind of like Rebel Assault, where you had full motion video, and then you had some sprites on top that were doing battle uh, interactively. The Dig just used um, Insane as a video player, essentially a glorified video player, uh, but it was still grafted on the scum. And at that point, you know, as I said, there's an abstraction layer. You have to say, well, every place we touch video, there's, you know, we go, we have to abstract that. So it's either a DOS video implementation or a Mac video implementation or whatever other platform we decide to port to. And Insane had its sets of abstractions, and Scum had its sets of abstractions. And what had happened in between Full Throttle and The Dig is that Eric Womander had taken the, those abstractions and merged them. They, they standardized on the Insane engine abstractions. And so Scum actually talked through Insane to draw its video. Even though it's not running full motion video, it still used the video routines. And so like, as from my perspective as somebody who was doing the port, all I had to do is port basically the Rebel Assault 2, the Insane uh, abstractions and I got the dig for free because Scum was already just talking through the same abstractions. So basically, and they used was... the, they used the insane for just the the interactive scenes as well, just displaying the the gameplay on screen, not just the yeah. the cutscenes. Yeah, so the cutscenes were were run through the video engine mm -hmm. and through insane. But then what would happen was Scum would draw its own video into its into a buffer, but to get from that video from its you know, internal buffers onto the screen, it would talk to Insane and say, here's here's a buffer, put this on the screen. And when it wanted to read the controls, it would talk to Insane and say, hey, tell me what keys are pressed. Before, Scum had its own way. It would talk directly to DOS or to Windows or to Mac and say, tell me what keys are pressed. And instead of doing that, it says, I'm going to talk to Insane. And Insane knows how to talk to DOS or Windows or whatever under the covers. I'll just ask Insane about what's pressed. And if I need to generate sounds, play a sound effect or whatever, uh, they, they used iMuse for that. So that was sort of a different level of abstraction. But that it was kind of the merging of the two engines that made the dig interesting and made it super easy for me. So like Rebel Assault 2 and the dig, those were super easy ports because you did it you kind of did it once, which I'd already done. Um, and it it kind of just came along for free. And you know, after that I did um there was Afterlife and Mortimer and the Riddles of the Medallion, which was a kids game. And mm -hmm. just basically built both on the Rebel Assault 2 engine. Afterlife was its own thing, it was, uh, but it was I had worked closely with them on how to write the abstractions. And so it was another game that was up on the Mac right away. In fact, it was well before it was released, we had the Mac version up and running. And in fact, I think it was a simultaneous release. I think it was our first game that was shipped simultaneously on DOS and the Mac was Afterlife. And did you get to work on Monkey Island 2? No, no, I just missed Monkey Island 2. However, I did get to go back and work on Day of the Tentacle and Sam and Max at the Road because those had never seen a Mac release. So the Mac releases kind of ended at Monkey Island 2. <clears throat> and then they didn't do Dot or Santa Max. And then Full Throttle was the first one I released. And it bugged, bugged me like no, to no end that we had this gap in the catalog of adventure games that were never released for the Mac. And so what I had done was I saw what they were doing with the dig, where they were making the abstraction layer uh, run on top of this insane abstraction layer. And I said, well, how about if instead of porting Dave the Tentacle and Sam and Max to the Mac, I'll port them onto the same abstraction layer and get it for free. Once I've done that port to the abstraction layer, then like all the work I've done on the abstraction will just work and all those games will just pop out. And you know, it took me a couple of weeks each, I think, to get them up and running. But nobody was expecting it. So I, I kind of I'd done it on the sly. I'd asked, hey, are we gonna do this? And they're like, no, we're not gonna do this. We're not gonna go back and port dot and Sam and Max. And I said, 
I, I was like, no, we gotta, we gotta do it. I said, I'm gonna do it whether you want to or not. I'm at least gonna go for my own personal benefit. I, if I were, if all that I get is that I can go home and play them on my own, then that's that'll be good enough for me. So I, I did it, and but I said, then I eventually came back to them. I said, well, we do have games for the Mac, two more free, and, you know, or, or in the can. You just gotta test them, and and, and uh, it turns out they. Uh, they eventually did see the light. They thought that there was some upside to that, and so we we shipped them both. And so I that means I got to do all the all the back end from day of the tentacle onward um, for the Mac, uh, all those now, home ports. Which is now nice. the reason I ask about the monk if you worked on Monkey Island too was because a few months ago someone on Twitter noticed that in the FM Towns version of Monkey Island two. The if you remember the game, there's a whole cliff and fishing pole se- sequence. Uh-huh. which contains vertical scrolling and that whole thing was removed from the fm towns version and it was also removed from the mac because apparently vertical scrolling was some kind of special dos uh, method that couldn't <laughs> be ported anywhere else so that's why i want i wanted to know if you uh, worked on, on that port to tell us uh, to shed some light on, on that whole mystery well actually i did hear about that and i, I went and looked and see how it works and it turns out that there's a um there's something called fades and the, the fades module in scum is what uh controls the screen transitions from one uh, room to another uh and that was one area that did have to be hand ported for each platform because a lot of times they were written in assembly language because they needed to do something very fast you know a fast scroll or a fast wipe or some kind of random random thing and so um I suspect what happened, and I'm pretty sure I did this on the Mac because I just punted. I said, uh, it's just a fate, it's just a transition between two rooms. It doesn't have to be fancy. And you know, I don't think I can make this go fast enough because on the Mac, we didn't have low res video modes, we only had high res video modes, and so we had to double every pixel. Mm-hmm. And so doing a fast scroll would mean moving four times the amount of memory on a slow machine, you'd see lots of ripples and stuff. It wouldn't be a very smooth thing. Uh, so I am surprised they didn't do it on the FM Towns though, because on yeah. the FM Towns they actually have hardware scrolling. If you play any of the FM Town versions of the games, they have super smooth. They're the only ones that have like pixel level scrolling when you're moving. You know, when the when the room is scrolling back and forth, it's it's not chunky like on all the other ports. And so you know, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure they could have figured out a way to do that in a with a smooth vertical scroll. But they just chose to remove it altogether. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> And which of the LucasArts games that you've worked on are you most proud of, and why? Well, in terms of like what I actually did on it, I would say Outlaws is probably the, the game that I'm most proud of in terms of. It's probably the one where I was the closest to a games programmer because as as, a, as somebody who does the ports, like I said, you're interfacing with the operating system, you're figuring out how to how to make things work as optimal as possible and and cut out all the places where, you know, they're referencing directly to the hardware and that kind of thing. But for Outlaws, you know, they kind of said, well, we're winding down our Mac efforts. Your talents would be better spent working on our A-list games rather than going off and doing another port, uh, which saddened me because I was looking forward to doing Shadows of the Empire and other mm-hmm. fun things like that. Um, but uh so I went, I joined the Outlaws team and there I got to work on like the weapon system and the network system and, and all that. And so I felt like I really had a hand in the actual game and gameplay of that game versus all the other ones where I was just making other people's work, you know, work in a different environment. So how how what was the technical challenge there in Outlaws specifically? Uh well, it was really our first, I mean it was our first windows only game that we released. So, you know, previously, I think there was a windows version of the dig that was shipped on some of the CDs. Um, that was a direct port. And I think there was a windows version of afterlife that shipped on the CD as well, but it was like a second version. In fact, a lot of them said, you know, you're going to get better results if you run this in DOS, uh, because at the time, you know, this is windows 95 era, which is coming up windows 98, you know, direct X was there, but it was like direct X three. It was the early versions of DirectX. You didn't trust it. It was not stable in a lot of the ways. It was, you know, it was kind of a crapshoot whether you would do that. And I was like, from a support perspective, it was really the big concern is if we ship this out Windows only, 
are we just going to be inundated with support calls from people saying, I can't get this to work on my machine? Are we going to have to refund lots of money? Are we going to have to, you know, pay lots of people to handle all these calls? And so DirectX was supposed to solve that. But in the early days, it was still pretty dicey. I would say it was not a, not a fun experience for a lot of us. Um, and so Outlaws was our first game that we were shipping that was only Windows. We were not doing a DOS version. And um, so what we did was we hedged our bets heavily. So for every DirectX component, we wrote a non-DirectX equivalent and we had a whole mechanism, we had a whole configuration program where you can select, am I gonna draw with direct draw or am I gonna draw with a SciTech Display Doctor, which had a Windows port as I understood it, or are we gonna draw with GDI, which is like fallback to just, you know, how your normal, you know, application level Windows draw. And for sound, are we gonna use direct sound or do you just wanna use the old classic wave streaming that's there? And for networking, they had, they had a direct, I think they had a direct play or, some kind of networking thing, um, but we didn't trust that either. So you could also go directly to Windsoc Windows sockets and for the networking. Um, so like every component, we had a hedge for input was the same thing for joysticks and, and mouse and everything. And it was a total hedge and, and it was super configurable. And so I was involved in a lot of that because a lot of that's kind of close to porting work. It's like, okay, you have three different interfaces that you want to talk to and be hot swappable. So you need to come up with the abstraction for you know, what is the interface that we're going to talk to as, as a game? And then how do we blast that out to the three interfaces and make them work under the covers? So that was one of the big technical things. And the other one was with multiplayer. It was our first networked multiplayer game. And um, we had never done it before. And the first version of it sucked. We, we totally screwed, screwed up the networking in the first early versions of it. And it was looking bad. We were like, okay, well, we've got to have networking, but this is not, it's not holding together. Our games are getting out of sync. Uh, and so... Uh, my office mate and I got together and said, okay, well, we're on top, we're on this problem. We're going to learn how to do a network game because I had no idea how to do it at the time. And we're going to rewrite the networking from scratch uh, so that, you know, you use dead reckoning and all the other techniques that are used now to do multiplayer. And I say, I'm pretty proud of that because in the end, we actually were able to support pretty reliably like 16 player games on a LAN, which at the time was, we're like, well, Doom was sort of the gold standard. You can do eight player games. Uh, and a good network there. And I'm like, we can do 16 player games pretty reliably. We're having big, you know, night 16 player dog fights every afternoon playing Outlaws in the uh, in, in the studios. And so that was so that PC was a lot gamers of could uh, play with Mac gamers. Uh, no, outlaws. no, because that never shipped for the Mac. That was the goal, though. It was going to be able to, it was going to be interplayable with, with the Mac at the time. I wanted that to happen. But no, we only ever shipped it for the PC. So that was all on the PC side. <laughs> now, now, I know it's kind of cliche to ask, but what's your favorite LucasArts game? And did you get to actually work on it? I would have to say the game I find the most fun and I revisit is Day of the Tentacle. I, um, I, I love the humor, I love the art style, and I love the way they play with the time and the history and 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 going things back and forth i just think to me that was that was really great uh so I, and i'm glad i got to work on it and that was actually one of the reasons why i wanted to go back and port it is because it looked like a lot of fun and once i did port it i played it all the way through on the mac and i thought well that was definitely worth it and i'm so glad i ported that and so i'm, I'm happy that i was able to work on it <laughs> so how long were you at the at lucas arts in total and why did so, you decide to leave <laughs> Yeah, you'd think I had my dream job, right? So yeah. uh, it starts for three and a half years. Every time every time we talk to uh, one of the LucasArts alumni, um, the main question is, why did you leave, David Fox? <laughs> I'm about to talk to Brett Taylor. So mm -hmm. why leave? So I was there for three and a half years. I spent the first year and a half doing Mac ports. I ported like 11, 10 or 11 games to the Mac. Pretty short order and then the max stuff on down i did outlaws for a good year and a half after that um oh no i did Outlaws for about a year because i came on late in that project uh then i was lead programmer on mysteries of the sith which was the jedi knight expansion pack mm -hmm. um so i sort of saw my trajectory as becoming lead programmer on on the next you know one of the next big games and so the next big game was going to be star wars episode one related um at the time we actually got to see a work print of episode one which you might think, okay, well, how was that? That was pretty awesome. And at the time, I was pretty excited. But the whole point of watching it was to like look for game ideas and think about, you know, how could you apply this to a game? So you're think your your mindset's not there to look at it as a movie. You're looking at it as a what fodder do I have in here to make a game from? And so, uh, 
So we were doing that and I started working um, on a project along those lines. It was going to be a first person lightsaber focused one. I, and then I, at this about a year before that, before I left, you know, a year and a half, I, I discovered emulation. So um, in the background, in my spare time, I had um, discovered uh, Digital Eclipse had released uh, their Williams emulators for the Mac. So on the Mac, you had um, ports of uh, emulations of Joust and Robotron and Defender. Um, and you could buy them as standalone things. And to me, that was, as I said, I grew up in the arcades. The arcade to me was always the holy grail. Even when I worked on video games for my computer, the goal was always to achieve an arcade feel or an arcade level of quality uh, to me. Because to me, that was that spoke for what I wanted. And so to take a real arcade game and play the real thing on my Mac, to me, that was the holy grail. I thought if I had found something completely amazing here, um, and so after that, I started looking into emulation. And I was on my Mac still, and uh, I saw there was Stella, which was an Atari 2600 emulator, still exists. Um, and Atari 2600 was also a fascinating machine to me because one of my good friends had one, and I played a lot of games on there. I thought, okay, well, that's that's an interesting introduction to emulation. And so I said they needed a Mac port, or they had a Mac port, but it was sort of languishing. I said, well, I can do, I can be your Mac port guy. And so I said, I'll do a Mac port of because porting was something I knew how to do. And I, and I got my hands dirty a little bit in the emulator to see how that actually worked. And so I kind of learned a little bit how emulators work through doing the port of that. But again, in doing a port, you don't have to really understand it there. So I kind of had to make the effort, extra effort to, to figure that out. Um, and then I heard about um, a program called Mac MAME, which was the Mac port of the MAME emulator, which at the time had just been created. So it, that started beginning of 98. And I heard about Mac MAME, which was done by a guy named Brad Oliver. And I had heard about that probably by, no, that was, no, sorry, I'm sorry, I have the wrong year. It was early 97 that MAME started. And by mid 97, Mac MAME was around. And so I was able to download that. And that was able to play Pac-Man and a few other, games at the time, I think it was only Z80 based games, which was still quite a lot of arcade games you could do. But I was sort of amazed to idea that here's an emulator, it's open source. I can look at how it works and understand emulation. And I could also help on the Mac port, make the Mac port more smooth. I didn't want to take it over, but I at least could help, you know, make that, make some improvements there because again, porting was the thing I knew how to do. Um, and so eventually it occurred to me that my favorite arcade game was not supported and that my favorite arcade game was mappy which is a uh, fairly i'd say it's like a b-tier uh, namco game so if you're if you're in japan you probably know about mappy but if you're not japanese you probably you have a 50 50 shot of actually maybe experiencing a mappy game in the wild and for whatever reason the uh the 7-eleven down the street from where i grew up had a mappy machine i played the heck out of that it became my quickly became my favorite arcade game and uh so i was saying well you know how can I how can I make Mappy work on my Mac? That was really my goal. And I said, well, MAME seems to be the right tool for it, but it's not supported. So what do I need to, to do to support this? And to do that, I had to kind of understand how what goes into an emulation, what the component parts were in a Mappy machine, whether the ROMs existed, whether somebody had dumped the ROMs from a Mappy machine. And so all those things just involved me doing a lot of research and figuring it out. And eventually I discovered that it was very close in hardware capability to Super Pac-Man. Uh, Super Pac-Man ran on a 6809, which is a Motorola chip I had never heard of before, as an 8-bit uh, processor um, that pre pre preceded the uh, 68000. Um, but it, it was uh, used in some things like the color computer, TRS-80 color computer, and a few other 8-bit uh, uh, systems. And so somebody had recently just added Super Pac-Man support. Um, to MAME, and that meant that they had added a processor emulation that was not Z80, it was the 6809. And so I said, well, here's what I need. I, I now have the processor I need, and so I don't have to write a new processor emulation. And uh, I suspect that Namco didn't like reinvent the wheel completely with every game, that they probably patterned things off of each other. And so I kind of took Super Pac-Man, and you know, I, I loaded the Mappy ROMs into Super Pac-Man, and I dumped out the disassembly of what they what they were doing. And I tried to look at what they were doing compared to what Super Pac-Man was doing and 
just kind of understanding it and really just studying the uh, 689 assembly language and my past experience with assembly language, you know, once you kind of know how assembly language works at all, the mnemonics are different, but it all kind of works roughly the same um, depending on the capabilities of uh, the processor. And so you pretty quickly kind of were able to piece together what was happening and uh, was able to get Mappy up and running, you know, in this infrastructure. Uh, one of the interesting things was that Mappy was the first Namco game to have the fancy, if you know Mappy, it's got a brilliant soundtrack with a pretty fancy music going on in the background. And um, it was way more advanced than what was what the earlier games like Pac-Man were capable of. And so um, that was one thing is I had to figure out how Namco took their three voice sound system and expanded it to an eight voice sound system for Mappy uh, with you know more, more capabilities so that they could play all the music and everything continuously. And so that so was- So you left LucasArts to work on MAME? Well, no, not officially. So that I actually, that was just the background. I forgot that that's where we were going. So thank you for getting me back. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, I got really into MAME, really into emulation. And I said, I'd really like a job where I could work on emulation because even though games was what I wanted to work on, what I realized what I really wanted to work on was arcade games. And also what I wanted to work on was games that were written by like one or two guys. And LucasArts was moving. I had put me on a trajectory to be on working on games. And all the games they were working on were supposed to be A-list games. They were going to involve dozens of artists and musicians and programmers and marketing. And they were huge. And there were high expectations. And I wasn't necessarily afraid of that, but I was just knew that it was going to be a slog to get through a game and ship it. And the time frame of these games was, you know, years. It was a few years. And in fact, if you know... I think our game is what eventually became Obi Wan, Star Wars Obi Wan, which I don't even, I don't even think I played when it came out because I think at the time I was kind of had moved on, you know, kind of from that. And so, um, but it took it, these games took years, and 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 Star Wars was actually not that interesting to me. You know, of the Lucas Arts games, the the adventure games were interesting to me. I liked Outlaws because it wasn't a Star Wars game, so it, it still had its interest. But the Star Wars stuff was, you know, you're kind of you just had a lot of rules for what you were allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, um, where you where you can go, and and so it felt it felt kind of constraining and and just big. And so I said, well, I'd rather work for a small company, a smaller company, maybe work on if I can figure out a way to work on emulation, that'd be great. And so I'm on the Mac at the time, um, a few like a year or two before uh, a small company called Connectix had released something called Virtual PC, and Virtual PC was a program that let you run uh, PC software on your Mac. So you could boot DOS, you could run DOS games, you could run DOS, you know, uh, productivity software, you could boot Windows in, in a window on your Mac. And it ran pretty well. It was optimized for the power PC, which as I mentioned before, I was super excited about. And so I was also excited to get back to the Mac because I'd been, you know, for the last year, year and a half, I'd been pushed to do Windows programming, which, you know, I didn't mind, but it was a new thing. And I kind of was thinking I want to be back on the Mac. So I said, well, let's, Connectus is a Mac focused company. They're doing emulation. It's not game emulation, but they did allow you to run games, you know. So I thought, well, that's that could be my my way into doing something commercial for emulation. And so I I applied for a job at Connectus and they had an opening, uh, to somebody to help work on virtual PC. And then I once they gave me a job there, it was, you know, down south of the Golden Gate Bridge instead of north of the Golden Gate Bridge. So it was a bit of a commute change, but it wasn't too far away. Uh, and I gave my resignation and said, I want to go work on emulation. And so that was a bittersweet time because, of course, I enjoyed my LucasArts time quite a bit. And I enjoyed the people there for sure. Um, but uh, I could kind of see that the kind of it wasn't really fitting with my model of what I wanted to do. And I was kind of hoping to get back to the Mac, get back to smaller scale projects. And emulation uh, was sort of the, my, my three main things. And that, that got me to leave. <laughs> and how long did you stay at the Kinetics? So Connectix, I uh, was there from 1998, and then we were acquired by Microsoft in 2003. So, so basically five years. Now, if I During... recall correctly, the, the first Windows version of Virtual PC was released in 2001. Now, I remember that because in 2002, I used it to create a Windows 95 Virtual PC in which I played Phantasmagoria 2, which stars <laughs> Paul Morgan Stetler, a.k.a. Curtis from Conversations with Curtis. Uh -huh. So I used the virtual PC back then to play games because that was the only get the only way to play Windows ninety five or um, older games basically at two thousand yeah. and and around that time 
Scum VM was also released. Scum VM recently uh, celebrated its 20th anniversary wow. back in 2021. So around that time, Scum VM was released. Now, when were you made aware of Scum VM and what are your thoughts? What were your thoughts about it and what are your thoughts about it? <laughs> yeah, so I have a I have a lot of respect for Scum VM uh, for what they've accomplished because they really they did what I didn't do in terms of when I do a port. When I did a port, I didn't have to tear apart the insides and understand how it worked. And to recreate an engine from scratch, like they did, they had to understand all the data structures and how they worked and try to replicate the behaviors as precisely as possible uh, and try to do it in a you know fairly clean room environment. I'm guessing. Um, and so I think, you know, it's it's a very different approach from, from what I did when I was working at, on, on the Mac ports, um, but it was pretty exciting because then you could, you have an engine and it's a universal engine, so it works on all the scum games, which is kind of nice. Um, and now it works on many other types of games as well. Um, and so you have like this universal engine. And then again, if you want to run that engine on different systems, it's a porting job. And porting job is a fairly easy job compared to writing something new. And so you know all the hard work is all the reverse engineering and stuff that goes into the engine. And from a main from a main perspective, all the work that I do in emulation, obviously I have a perspective on reverse engineering and how challenging that can be um, as well. And so um, nothing about respect for those guys uh, for for what they do. The only thing that nags me about it, and it's not their fault, it's just that the fundamental approach of doing uh, a reverse engineering of the engine is that. It's only as good as how perfect your recreation is and where you choose to, you know, how far you want to go. Uh, and uh, from my mind, coming from an emulation point of view, when you emulate at a lower level, you're emulating hardware rather than emulating a software engine. The hardware is super well-defined in most cases, certainly for emulating like a PC or something. Um, and so you can create a lot of the behaviors uh, if you want a little more authentic behavior to what you experienced, you know, when you ran the original software on the original hardware, um, then, you know, emulation is going to give you that. Um, but there's pros and cons each way because, you know, you have all the downsides of like, I have to free up enough DOS memory to run this game and I have to, you know, that stuff's coming. You never see that in Scum VM. Uh, so the idea of Scum VM is, you know, the engines are are smooth. The interaction with the user is smoothed out a lot because you're focusing on the game and, and replicating the the experience of the game, and not so much on on the edges that you know when you have an emulator. You know, if you load load Mame or what today you can run you know DOS and or, or PC emulation in Mame or any other DOS emulators. You, know, you got to boot DOS. You got to run the install program. You got to go through all this stuff that you know are just like the hard edges that we had to experience. To us, it's not a big deal because we're like, yeah, I remember having to set up my machine or create a boot disk or whatever. But, you know, to a modern user who you kind of want to experience the game, that's like a lot of uh, friction for them to have to go through in order to experience something. So, you know, for I'd say for a lot of users, uh, Scum VM is, 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 uh, is a great solution uh, for what they want. And for if you're hardcore like me and want to experience, you know, a little more of what it was like at the time, then, you know, emulation may be... Uh, more of the approach to go. And I, I think they're not incompatible. I think they both coexist and have their proponents each way. So Well, you mentioned that they're reverse engineering. And for example, uh, that particular bug, let's call it in F FM Towns, in which they remove the vertical scrolling was re-added in ScumVM because they could do it. They reverse yes. engineered the whole thing and they could fix bugs inside of it. Yeah. Now, a lot of our viewers probably know ScumVM, but I'm sure that be, they'll be very interested to hear about your current project, Dream with a double M. <laughs> so what does Dream stand for and what is it exactly? So just a little bit of history before I dive into it. Mm -hmm. In 2003, after I left LucasArts, I contacted them and said, hey, you know, it's kind of a pain to run these LucasArts DOS games on Windows. This is the Windows XP era now, and a lot of them were starting to become more and more problematic to run. I said, I did all those ports of the DOS, of the Scum games to the Mac. How about you send me the source code? I'm good at porting. I've done a recently ported MAME to run on Windows. It was originally a DOS only program. I ported it to run on, on Windows. I'm all that memory is super fresh in my head. 
how about you give me the source code, I'll make DOS or Windows native versions of all your uh, scum engines, and you can just reship those games with my new executables, and the games will run on Windows and modern Windows with support and no bugs that were um, due to compatibility with Windows, due to DOS compatibility problems with Windows. If there's bugs, it's my fault, you know, because we we messed up the Windows port. But it'll at least be a a, a more seamless environment, and you can have window, you can have the uh, full screen, or you can run it in a window. You can have the graphics smoothing that the Mac ports had. Um, and so I pitched this to LucasArts. I said, just hire me as a contractor. Give me the source code. I can do this. It'd be pretty cheap, I think, for for them to do that. And uh, I did some hemming and hawing, and they're like, the people I contacted were very enthusiastic. They're like, yeah, that'd be great. But the management was sort of like. We're looking forward. We're trying to. We don't really want to spend a lot of time on old, old titles, uh, so they weren't super interested. But eventually, a compromise was made where they're like, you know, if you think you can do this quickly, you know, and you can get the source code, we'll give you the source code. You can you can do it. We'll, we'll pay you to do it, but there's no guarantee of you know whether we're going to ship it or how we're going to ship it, what's going to happen. And so I did this, and I took all the games. I did exactly what I did for the Mac ports of Day of the Tentacle as I ported them all to run on top of the Insane layer. So even back to Maniac Mansion, I had made Maniac Mansion to run on top of the Insane graphic porting layer. And then I just ported Insane the one time and all the games lit up. Um, all the experience I had from the Mac stuff lit up. I had all the nice features. Of, they all had the same basic engine where you could change full screen mode. You could correct the aspect ratio because the if you just double up the pixels, you get a kind of a squashed effect on all the graphics. Mm. Um, and you could get the graphic smoothing that was added for the Mac releases of the games. And I, I did that and I made them all, I sent them all the thing and heard, I sent them all to LucasArts and they paid me a little bit of money, not very much because it wasn't a, a big job. And I kind of more wanted to do it than get a lot of money out of it. And then they kind of just sat there for a while. Um, Which games were these? Next, all of them. Uh, Maniac all Mansion. the scum games or all, all of the, the scum games. Sorry. sorry, yeah, all the scum games. So Maniac Mansion, Zach, Loom, The Monkeys, both Indies, Day of the Tentacle, Sam and Max, Full Throttle, The Dig. I did not do Curse. I didn't do anything with Curse of Monkey Island. So um, everything except Curse. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So and so they had it in their hands. Uh, I worked with them for a little while longer because they were going to try to at the time they were experimenting with downloading, having downloadable games. And the idea of downloading a CD level game in 2003 over the internet, you know, still a lot of dial up. It was pretty crazy. And so they wanted to release like a downloadable version of Full Throttle. And we worked a real hard on trying to like compress the sound further. I had all these techniques where I'd like use AUG or other compression techniques to, to get the sound down to a point where it was downloadable, you know, like under hundred megs was our goal. We wanted to get Full Throttle down to under hundred megs with all the cutscenes and, and sound and voice and everything. And uh, I got it pretty close. I think I got it down to like- 101. Was it? 101, <laughs> no, you got it down to- No, it wasn't quite that close, but it was like, it was like under 150, I think. And they decided it was close enough. And I don't even remember if they released it or if it was just a proof of concept. And then several of the European uh, vendors that they worked with wanted to release updated versions. And so they would pick and choose like the, I've I've now gone through, through because of my new project. I've gone through and found all the places where they shipped my my versions, and I think like the Italians shipped a version of Indie Fate of Atlantis with my version with my uh, interpreter, and then like the day of the tentacle one was shipped in French at least, and I think the Australian vendor shipped uh, Full Throttle and and Sam and Max, I think, and so none of the really early ones ever shipped out as for anything, but like. At least Indie Fate and Day of the Tentacle, Sound Max, Full Throttle, and The Dig all showed up somewhere for at least one release as a throw in to run on a lot of modern Windows. So, anyway, I had done all that work and it always bugged me that the rest of them never got released. The old games were pretty much neglected and that there was really no official way to do this. And I thought, well, I could revive the code and then go contact LucasArts and say, hey, can I, can I will you finally let me release? Because what I really wanted to do was, all you needed was the executable I made, the Windows executable. You could drop that right next to all your DOS files, and it would just pick up those DOS files and run. So you didn't really need, all they need to do is like make it like a patch. They could pretty much release them, at, release these Windows versions as patches online to say, download the Windows version, and then you can run, run it on your Windows machine. And they never did that. And I was kind of frustrated. Me, I was like, why don't you do that? It's like the easiest thing. And I 100% believe it's because of testing. They didn't have the time or the resources to test them all so they were comfortable putting their stamp of approval on it. 
And I thought, well, maybe I could talk them into it now. And I'm like, well, now they're part of Disney. So that's going to be pretty hard. And I thought, well, what if there's another way to kind of give the same experience of, you know, just double click and run these, these scum games, but without having the source code? Because if I use the source code, I have to get permission from LucasArts. So if I didn't have the source code, if I shoot using any of the source code, if I could just do that, I could do an emulator. Obviously, that's something I'm experienced with. But emulation has hard edges. You have to boot DOS. You need a copy of DOS. So now you have licensing issues. Uh, how do you get a copy of DOS legitimately? Um, and uh, and then you know you need to be able to install and run from the original media and run the installers and everything like that. And it's just it's a pain for users. And you know people are just going to use Scum VM anyway in that case. And it's like you're not going to people aren't going to go through the extra effort to to do that. And if you want to provide an emulation level experience. Um, where you're you're not worried about reverse engineering uh, level problems. You're mostly worried about uh, porting problems or emulation problems. I felt like those were more practical, practical problems. And so I thought, what if I could smooth off all the hard edges of the emulation and provide an, an emulator that's kind of custom made? It's not a generic DOS emulator. It's a emulator that was specifically tailored to run the scum games. It knew about how to extract all the files from the scum games and and find the executable program in there and then run that executable in a DOS emulator that would not actually be running DOS. It'd be more like DOSBox does where they have like a pseudo DOS. We intercept every time they try to call into DOS and do our own thing. Um, but I said, that's actually a model that I think I can make. The idea was I would write something that was indistinguishable from my old ports that I did in 2003 of, to Windows where like you could just take the executable put it next to your DOS files, double click it, and it would pick those up and run. And the idea was I would make, make an emulator that was way more complex under the hood because it's not running it's not running a port of the code. It's running an emulation of the original code. And you could take that emulator, drop it next to a set of files, and you double click it, and it would look at those files and say, oh, I recognize that this is Day of the Tentacle. I will configure my emulation to run Day of the Tentacle, and I'll spit it out there and, and just make it super easy to run that. And so I said, Sure, why don't I see if I can make that work? And that uh, one thing led to another. You know, I started off with like the early games with a 16-bit DOS, you know, emulation. And that that was pretty fun for a while. And then I thought, well, I want to run like Santa Max. The later Santa Max CD version needed a 32-bit emulation. Those required a 386. So I added that. I kind of knew that was coming. And then I said, well, um, FM Towns, they had Zach McCracken 256 color version, which is the only official way to play 256 color Zach. And I said, well, I kind of want to play that. And maybe I, maybe in addition to simulating DOS, I could also simulate the FM Towns operating system, which is quite extensive. Uh, it was an interesting thing to do. And everything's in Japanese. So I was using my Google, my phone with Google Translate on screenshots to read what the documentation said I was supposed to do. Things and they so couldn't I, do I, back in the 90s. Yes, I couldn't do that back in the 90s. So I did that from town stuff, and then I'm, I released that, and then I thought, well, Curse of Monkey Island is the one scum game I can't get running. So I said, well, what if I added support for running just a minimal set of Windows? And so I actually added support for hooking all the Windows calls and loading a Windows executable and doing that. And so it's kind of expanded from like this little 16-bit DOS emulator into uh, sort of a a Swiss Army knife emulator that can do DOS or FM Towns or Windows uh, versions of games. And so eventually I released 1.0 last June, July, I think it was July, July or 1.0. Uh, that was um, the first release and it had support for all the scum games starting from Maniac Mansion up through Curse of Monkey Island. And the idea is that, you know, if you own these games, you can take your disc images or uh, your physical media, your floppy disks or your CD-ROMs, you can put them in and just run them directly off the CDs if you want. Um, and uh, the idea was just to provide a way for if you've got this old software, you can just run it. And so um, to be kind of a super easy, low low route, low uh, impact way with not a lot of friction to run your old games and in sort of a curated way uh, and provide a few nice features, but not a lot of nice features. The goal is to be pretty authentic to the original experience. Now, the first time I heard of Dream was when it was still in beta and uh -huh. you've encountered an issue with the Hebrew version of Loom a version which I happen to have, 
So our first correspondence revolved around that specific version. Can you elaborate a bit on what the issue was with the Hebrew version and how you knew it in advance before you even had that version? So I had released the beta and I'd been... So inside of Dream, it actually knows about all the officially released releases of the games um, that I've been able to find. Hmm. Um, and so whenever it found, whenever you tried to run it using one that it says, well, I recognize these files, but they're not the same as the ones that I'm familiar with, it would pop up a dialogue and say, hey, send me this information by email and I'll include it in the next version because I know that this is a new officially released version. Mm-hmm. And somebody sent me a note that said, hey, you don't have support for the Hebrew version, uh, saying it's the German version. And I said, I did not know that there was ever a Hebrew version of anything um, released from LucasArts, because that was the first I'd heard of it. You know, I, I knew there was the usual European languages, and I knew that some of the later games had uh, Korean and uh, Japanese, and I think even Chinese releases. Um, but I'd never heard of a Hebrew version of anything. I was thinking to myself, how did they even do that with the right to left orientation and everything like that. I thought that was way beyond what Scum can handle. Uh, it was certainly not designed for that kind of stuff. Um, so I was super curious about it. Uh, eventually was able to um, to lay my hands on it. Was that through you or was that through Yeah, I person? sent you a copy. Okay, I wasn't sure, yeah. You were able to send it to me, so I was able to test it and make sure it worked in, in Dream and was, was recognized by such. But it was a completely new interaction to me and one of those cool bits of ephemera that come out when you really try to dig into the catalog i mean i've a lot of what dream does which oh i forgot to mention you you wanted to know what dream stood for so i knew i needed to have some maniac mansion related um double M. terminology in my in my name and uh you know and so i kind of created a, a backronym of uh well what could i call it that would end in mm because scum was script creation utility for maniac mansion so i was like well if it ends in mm what could i do with that and i came up with a uh, dos retro emulation arena for maniac mansion so it's completely made up uh just because i thought dream was close enough to something that i could stick two m's on the end of and get the maniac mansion reference in there so <laughs> and you got but, two uh, trademarks there dos and maniac DOS. mansion <laughs> Well done. <laughs> they're, they're not my trademarks. <laughs> no, I've been following you on Twitter and as, as of late on Mastodon for quite uh-huh. some time. And it's been quite interesting to see and basically follow your, your journey of adding support for non-scam games uh, in Dream. Games like Grim Fandango and, and Escape from Monkey Island, which didn't use this the scum engine, but instead used the Grime-E engine due to them mm-hmm. both being 3D games. Right. Now, what differs in your approach of adding support for these games as opposed to the already supported SCUM games? Mm-hmm. And what technical difficulties did you encounter or are still encountering with <laughs> Grime? Yeah. yeah, so um, so the nice thing about an emulator is that, you know, if when when a program like scum vm wants to add support for a new engine they have to tear apart that engine and reverse engineer it figure out how it works it's like it's a, it's a big effort um for in theory with an emulator if i emulate windows 95 say and i can already run one windows 95 game i should in theory be able to run all windows 95 games now that's not really the case because um to make to improve compatibility with an emulator, you have to run lots of throw lots of stuff at it. The, the more stuff you throw at it, the more bugs you find in your emulation, and the more solid it becomes. Um, also, I've taken an approach where I don't implement anything unless it's used. So, for example, when you load a Windows program, it connects to the operating system and says, "I need you know these hundred routines from the operating system," and I had to implement versions of those hundred routines in my emulator in order for the emulation to work. However, program B comes along and he says, I use those 100 routines, but also these 20 extra routines. I didn't implement those 20 extra routines. I know they exist in Windows, but I'm not going to implement them until I see somebody use them because A, it makes me move fast. I can move faster in getting things up and running. But B, unless I have something to test it with, you're, you're, you're just kind of programming in the air with no validation that what you've done is correct. And so um, for getting Curse of Monkey Island, it was the only Windows game I was running at the moment was Curse of Monkey Island. So I had just enough implementation of Windows for Curse of Monkey Island, which was one of the simplest games. It didn't load 
any DLLs apart from system system DLLs. It taught used DirectX direct uh, draw to draw, and it was very simple. Six forty four eighty, uh, you know, eight bit graphics. The sound was super simple. It used direct sound streaming, very easy. Um, so it was it was probably the easiest target I could have picked to run on Windows. And so to get another game running, I had to load. You know, I looked at Grim Fandango, and I said, well that'd be the obvious next step of what I could run um, in the emulator is the the two adventure games that were not scum. Uh, so I picked up Grand Fandango and I ran it and it was using a whole bunch of stuff I had never touched before. <laughs> it was actually a pretty big lift from Curse of Monkey Island to, to Grim Fandango. So Grim Fandango uses Direct3D. So there's 3D rendering that uses, um, it loads DLLs dynamically for, um, for various uh, sound effects and, uh, 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 sound processing. <clears throat> and um, so what I had to do is implement a whole bunch of new stuff. I had to implement a whole software. I did it all in software. I did software 3D rendering into a window so for for compatibility. Fortunately, I had done that kind of work in the past in MAME. I had, a, I had written a full 3D FX Voodoo uh, 1 and 2, gen, 2 emulator. And so I kind of knew how to do software, a good, well, decent performing 3D and software. And so I was able to um, implement that plus all the stuff that it needed, but it was just sort of, you know, you 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 load the program and you say, okay, well here's here's the 150 things it needs to talk to in the operating system, and I create stubs for all of those, which is saying like I haven't implemented this yet, but if you call it, let me know so that I can go and implement it, and then you run the program until it crashes and says, oh, I hit the stub that you haven't implemented, and I go write that code, and then I run the program again, get to the next point, run it a little bit further, oh no, it's calling this program. So um, it's, it's just a great taken approach. over. It's a, it's a great approach. It's very iterative. Uh, but it, it eventually got me to the point where it was up and running and actually runs quite well. And so I had to support things like, you know, 16-bit color uh, and 32-bit color. Actually, I think it only uses 16 and Grim and Dango and all the 3D rendering. The sound wasn't too much different. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it was actually, you know, I had never actually... I, I hate to admit it, but I've never actually played Grim Fandango directly when it was released. And so I, I've fiddled with the remastered version before, but that was my first experience with the with the raw native version was getting it up and running in my emulator. Do you know so. that they thank you in the credits for the remastered version? Oh, do they? Yeah. Probably. Pro I wonder why. I probably used had some technology that had my name on it that they was part of Grim Fandango. I remember those guys working on it and uh and um you know, at the time we, uh, the Grim Fandango still used the insane engine for its cutscenes. Didn't use a third party thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's probably for that is my guess because this, the audio video synchronization in Windows was kind of hard to achieve in the early DirectX days. And so I had done a lot of work on that for Outlaws. Um, we had this, Outlaws starts with a giant 10 minute cutscene. And at the very end of the cutscene, there's a scene where the marshal takes a shovel and jams it into the ground. And that's, the most obvious place if your sound and video have drifted out of sync over the course of 10 minutes, if that does not line up, you notice it, it's very bad. And so um, one of my favorite LucasArts stories is that I've been working real hard to figure out how to get sound synchronization working on Windows for that engine. And that we were having a big demo day for the executives of the opening of Outlaws. And we actually had all the execs in the boardroom and we were all sitting there watching it and they were playing the whole cutscene. And, and for the first time on Windows with my tweaks to the engine to actually get them to sync. And uh, all the developers who were there were like holding their breath for that. Like, was that going to sync at the very end of 10 minutes? You know, and uh, when it synced, everybody was like, woohoo. So, <laughs> so I suspect and, and my this was for was the Mac on. board? No, this was for Windows when I was working on Outlaws. So uh, it was just, you know, you had to change your whole model for timing. Uh, for in order to get those kind of things because you have to synchronize off the sound card because over 10 minutes you know your sound card has a has a crystal in it that controls the speed that it plays back and the tolerance of those crystals depending on you know how cheap the manufacturer of your soundboard is could be as high as one percent or more and if you're talking your know, 44 kilohertz samples and you're one percent off that might not seem like much but it accumulates and over 10 minutes, it's gonna be off. So you really have to use your sound card as your timing source, at least in those days, and time your video off it. Cause you won't notice the difference between 
five frames per second, 30 point, you know, one frames per second, but you will absolutely notice when those things don't line up because of the sound. And so sound has to sort of take priority there. And we kind of had to rejigger our entire timing mechanism for the insane engine around the audio clocks. So probably that's why they thanked you in the remaster. Probably because they probably still had my player in there. For Escape and, from Monkey Island, they moved to to using um, Smacker. And Smacker. have you ever considered emulating non LucasArts games, like you know? Oh yeah, the for sure. The, the the temptation, the temptation is when you write an emulator, and everybody falls into this, myself included, is that you you say I've got this thing that can run. It's it's a platform. I can run anything that and they're right on that platform. I can in theory run it. And, uh, you know, I've toyed with the idea of running other stuff. I have ideas for emulators that I probably wouldn't call dream, but I would probably make another bespoke emulator for another class of games that maybe I remember from my childhood or or a class of games that are interesting. You know, I, you know, it might be, seem obvious to go like after more adventure games like the Sierra games or something. And I do have a soft spot for them because I had a PC junior and the original King's Quest ran in 16 colors on the PC Junior version, that was like the demo program for the PC Juniors when they were in the thing as they'd run King's Quest 16 color. And so I have an affinity for that, but I also really, I don't want to feel like I'm chasing Stone VM's tail all the time either because, you know, we do overlap a decent amount and there are other games and interests that I have that would be kind of cool to get up and running on, on an emulation platform like I have. So, you know, I have a lot of flexibility in what I can do. I think there's, there's holes that emulation doesn't cover very well right now. Um, you know, you have things like DOSBox and DOSBox can run a bunch of stuff, but it doesn't run like the bootable games. There's There was a class of games that came out when I was having PC Junior that would just boot directly off the floppy. They didn't run DOS at all. Uh, and I don't know, maybe they do have support for that, but I don't know how well supported those are. You know, and I remember things like Night Mission Pinball or Microsoft Flight Simulator. Those things would boot directly from the floppy. The old Infocom games would actually be run on DOS. You know, those would boot from... Uh, directly from the floppy or, you know, the cartridge based PC junior games. So it's also don't, DOSBox doesn't handle that kind of stuff pretty easily either. So, you know, maybe those are an interesting area that, you know, from my past would be interesting to me. And as a freelance, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this for, for the love of it. So it's just sort of, you know, find, find some interesting hole. And I think another area that's not super well covered are like the early 95 and DOS, Windows 95 and 98 games. A lot of those games are really hard to get running these days or they're very iffy compatibility wise. And I have an engine that can run, basic Windows stuff, you know? So there's 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 stuff to get through to make those games run well, but, and, you know, installers are one of the big hardest things to, because I i don't have a good solution for how you'd run early Windows installers on my platform. Yeah, the, the late 90s were the dark ages of PC gaming because every, every game manufacturer had a different set of functions, of methods, of everything. Like you can get most of the games from i think the late 2000s mm -hmm. and the early 90s working on a modern uh, computer but everything from 97 on until 2003 2004 for example i'm trying to run indiana jones and the infernal machine which is another uh -huh. sort of game and it runs horribly and i wanted to stream it on twitch I can't <laughs> stream it because it runs in a weird resolution and everything works uh, very clunky yeah yeah so i discovered that a lot an escape from monkey island as well like trying to get because i was running into problems where i could get it up to a certain point i wouldn't run past that and i wanted to run it even beginning and running in an emulator it's like finding the right version of windows that would even run it well in an emulator because the emulators don't have a lot of the emulators don't have direct 3d support or you know you, so you kind of need to the games that required 3d are actually even harder to get running because Either you have a virtual 3D card, which I haven't seen a lot of great support for that. I tried it in VirtualBox and it sort of had like a, they said they had a 3D support in it, but it didn't really work very well for Curse of Monkey, for Escape from Monkey Island. So I had to, I think I got it working with like software OpenGL version. I was able to kind of run that and in a Windows 2000 virtual machine and, and, and VirtualBox. And that was just enough for me to debug a little bit to figure out what was going on. Um, okay, so what what are your future plans for Dream? Which games do you want to ultimately support there? Well, I obviously have a soft spot for the games that were going on when I was there, and so I've been um, adding some support for uh, Dark Forces for for some non scum games. So I think Dream 
may actually be more of less of an adventure game only emulator and more of a lucas arts emulator i think that's still a reasonable scope to keep it to mm -hmm. uh you know maybe infernal machine could be an eventual thing to look at i don't know <laughs> i i don't know that it's your next well, priority but... yes exactly but i, I kind of want to get you know, I've got X-Wing and TIE Fighter, the original versions and the collector CDs up and running. So those have been kind of interesting. And I got Afterlife and Rebel, the two Rebel Assaults going. Um, so, you know, I kind of want to get the games that I was involved in. I wouldn't mind getting Outlaws. Outlaws is on my short list of things to look at, though it may be kind of hard. I'm not quite sure. You know, I, I have a soft spot for Indiana Jones and his desktop adventures. Um, which I actually did a Mac port of, which was probably the hardest Mac port really? I did. Yes, because well, I, I guess it's difficult because in Indiana Jones and Desktop Adventures, everything is based on Windows UI in general. Yes, yes, that's actually why I'm. I it'd be a big work, a big amount of work to do that for Dream because I I'm hoping most of the games use Direct X and go full screen. And once you do that, I it's a lot simpler. I don't have to worry about drawing win Windows widgets and buttons and interacting and a lot of that stuff I can just kind of gloss over. So, you know, if I had to do desktop adventures, I'd probably need to make that work. Even Afterlife, uh, the Windows version that shipped, uh, it doesn't run full screen DirectX as far as I can tell. I think it runs in a window uh, where it uses GDI, which is the, you know, Windows uh, basic graphics drawing interface. And uh, so that would be a lot of work to get GDI working because well, if, you, if you're adding indiana johnson his desktop and ventures you should also add the auto stories to well, of course that that bummed me out because i actually did the port of indiana johnson's desktop adventures and i never got a chance to do yoda stories for the mac so mac users only got the indiana jones game even though yoda stories was pretty much like a re as far as i can tell it's basically a reskin yeah version of it so but that's fine you know i, I enjoyed that kind of adventure and to me I'm, it belonged on the mac because it was a I don't know if you remember if you're an early Mac guy or not, but early Macs came with things called desk accessories, and these were these were not full. They originally weren't full fledged apps. They were actually a little. They were hung off the Apple menu, and they were things like calculator and clock, and they had a little puzzle game, like a little shifting puzzle game. Um, and the idea was like they were small games or widgets that you would that had their own little runtime environment. And to me, Indiana Jones and his desktop adventures felt like an old desk accessory. And so that's kind of why I want to do it on the Mac. I was like, it feels like a desk accessory kind of game. It's like a little diversion. You know, you can play for 10, 15 minutes, solve an adventure. Uh, so I did that. But yeah, it was a total pain for it. Because I, yeah, it was just a lot of technical drudgery. <laughs> I hacked the sources like crazy to make it work. It was not a clean, not something I was proud of. <laughs> well, I've taken enough of your, of your time. Now, before we say goodbye, I have a bonus question for you. Okay. Now, most people, most of the people from my generation and your generation probably have an extensive CD collection in storage somewhere, but you actually took the time and just like with the postcards that you scanned them all, you ripped all of your CDs in the Flux lossless format <laughs> and you call that project the final rip and can you tell us about that project and what, what made you undertake such a, such a project? So I've always been kind of a... Uh... I got into CDs early. I, I got my first CD player in like 85, I think. And um, I had a boom box. I took it with me to college. And I got super into the used CD collection. And I just accumulated used CDs and tons of CDs. And I, I eventually had like 1,500 some odd CDs over the time. Not hard, very few of them were purchased at retail price. Um, but um, over the years, I love to make mixtapes of them. I love to catalog them for some reason. I was like, I like statistics and information. I love that CDs would tell you how long each track was. So you could actually catalog how long each track was. So when you made a mixtape, you could like say, okay, I got enough room to fit these songs on this side of the tape and that kind of thing. So that was big into all that, you know, in college and in high school. And then, um, so then I'd ripped them when MP3 players came out. I, I had a, one of those um, big clunky ones. It was a, not an iPod, but it was a competitor to iPod. It was a big clunky one. I had one of those. Uh, and uh, I ripped everything to MP3, regrettably. And it was a huge project to rip everything to MP3. And even though they were decent MP3s, it always nagged me that they weren't ripped losslessly. And so I said, well, one day I'm going to go back and just do them all losslessly. And so eventually I, I 
I just sat down and did it. I just it was something a background process. You just have a stack of CDs on your left. You pop them in one by one, and then catalog them all. And then uh, have I have now have three giant suitcases full of all the discs. You know, throughout all the plastic and and stuff, it's just the discs and their booklets and and, and sleeves stacked in three giant things outside. But well, it's nice that you still had a CD-ROM drive to. To rip the, to rip the. I still have a CD-ROM drive. <laughs> really? Yes. Well, no. I have a, it's I have a, a, is yeah. it a DVD drive or an actual CD? Oh, that's drive? true. It's not your right. It is a DVD drive. Yeah. But I did purchase for the uh, for my dream project. I purchased a, a USB floppy disk so that I can. Uh, in fact, I think I still got my Zach McCracken uh, Zach McCracken uh, PC you disk that, that I used because I actually wanted to see if I could use Dream to run directly off of the original hardware. And so I said, well, I want the full floppy experience. Even got to the point where it said insert disk two. And uh, that was that was fun. So you're not looking for copies online. You're you're going for the original stuff. Well, I want to support everything. So yes, I I, I start with the original when I, when I have the original, which I have many originals, but for breadth of supports, I, I had to look online to find some copies um, there to make sure that, and it's hard to find legit ones because a lot of people have hacked them up or for scum VM, they've discarded all the files they didn't need, mm -hmm. which unfortunately dream needs the original executable file and, and to create a file, to create a set of files for scum VM to use, you don't need that file. And so a lot of collections have stripped out files they don't need to save a little bit of space. So that was one unfortunate thing I discovered when I was trying to find, you know, collections of, of things to make sure I had, you know, every language of every and every release of every version in my catalog. So, but, you know, I think we've done, done a good job of, of digging up some stuff along the way, which is good. And the Internet Archive helps. Well, Aaron Giles, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time to join me for this conversation. And I wish you lots of success with Dream. I'll keep track. And with all of the emulation that you'll hopefully bestow upon us in the future. Yeah, thanks. I love emulating. So I'm sure you'll see some more stuff from me in the future. Thanks. Thank you. And that was Daniel Albu's interview with Aaron Giles. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you understood it because it pretty much went right over my head. <laughs> but if you enjoyed this conversation and you'd like to see more of these technical interviews that Daniel conducts with other programmers and developers, let us know and we'll make it happen. In the meantime, I want to thank our Patreon members and our coffee donors for making conversations with Curtis happen. If it wasn't for them, we would not be able to continue this project. And as we are moving into 2023, we are going to need a little bit more support. So if you are in a position to do so, we would love for you to join us on Patreon or Coffee and help keep conversations with Curtis chugging along into the new year. Once again, many thanks to Aaron Giles for taking the time to talk with Daniel and many thanks to Daniel for making this conversation happen. Okay, that's all for now. Thanks for watching and we will see you again on our next Conversations with Curtis.